All right. Pastor Jerome Gay Jr., glad to have you. Welcome. Welcome. Glad to be here. I appreciate you having me on your show, Malik. Not a problem. So uh, you're a pastor uh, in North Carolina, and I wanted to talk to you about faith. Uh, I am realizing that there is a lot of changes happening as it relates to what's normal. Uh, I think at a certain point in time, it was just kind of understood that most black people go to church. Now, how they live, that's a whole different thing. But by and large, most of us go to church, grew up in church. It's just culturally the norm. And I think I've noticed a shift where uh, either people aren't going, uh, people that went are denouncing Christianity or church attendance. Uh, you hear stuff like, I'm spiritual, not religious. You're hearing that much more of that. And even more so, I'm hearing more of... Uh, people saying uh, that the Bible and Christianity is somehow uh, a white man's religion, a white man's book. Mm -hmm. So overall, I can say that uh, I see people trending away. And even if it's Absolutely. just conversationally, uh, it, it's happening. Um, and it may not be trendy to say I'm a black Christian in 2021. So as a pastor, I wanted to know what you think about that. And where do you stand on that in terms of being both Christian and black? Yeah, great question. I, I would first say, if we look historically and presently, it's actually never been trendy to be a Christian, period. Okay. I think it's important for people to understand that because the, the Christian ethic and the Christian worldview goes against culture. So if we look at the values of urban culture, and when I say urban, I don't mean black. I mean the, the values of urban culture, which has permeated American culture. Mm -hmm. uh, there are essentially several aspects of it. Um, uh, no, number one is, is self-expression. America is big, urban culture is big on self-expression, whether that's a tattoo on your face or, you, you know, now there's just this expressing your weight and not being ashamed. Um, they're selfish pursuit. People are told to get the bag, get the coins, get money by any means necessary to get it. Uh, there's a, there's spiritual tolerance. And that's this aspect of where we should not tell people how to live. And so mm -hmm. your truth is your truth. That's the phrase that you hear. Social justice. That's another component of American culture. And then uh, sexual freedom. Like you, you should explore, you should experiment. But if we go back to the spiritual tolerance one, um, when you think about that, Christianity is going to always oppose aspects of those values because it's an exclusive faith. It's monotheistic, meaning that we believe in one God. And as a result of that, for us to say that Jesus is the only way, that's going to offend some of the core tenets of urban and American culture. So I think it's first we just got to understand like, like Christianity has never been popular. Like contrary to popular belief, even though we we see it a lot and people go to church, when you look at the numbers and the stats, still a lot of people just don't identify. Or we would even say they may say they're spiritual or Christian, but Jehovah's Witnesses would not fall under the, the realm of Christianity based on Orthodox Protestant Christendom, um, not even aspects of Roman Catholicism. So that's the first thing we need to kind of dispel this idea that based on a biblical ethic that America is a Christian nation. The reality is it isn't. That's just not the truth. Um, but when you talk about being black and Christian, uh, I think the the misnomer is that we found Christ on the plantation. And so when you have so many black people saying that um, they have drawn a conclusion that to that Christianity opposes your blackness, because Christianity devalues your blackness. Yeah. Now that's a that's a false equivalent, but I understand and that's why, you know, I, that's why I wrote about this is that I understand that people have a legitimate concern about the whitewashing of Christianity and whitewashing slavery as if somehow God was foreshadow slavery. But I must disagree with their conclusion. Just because someone misuses something it doesn't re it doesn't remove the vitality or the the potency of uh, the the claims being made. So I could take a hammer and I can build, but I could kill someone with it. That doesn't make hammers wrong. It makes me wrong. And so we have to stop associating white supremacy with Christianity. White supremacists were wrong. 
And if they were unrepentant, they weren't even Christians based on first John. And we have to begin to have that discussion. So I think I, I always push back because I see people making an eternal decision to reject Christ based on misinformation because they haven't actually studied. And the reality is we're not told about Africa's influence on the Christian faith. And that's why I think people come to that conclusion that it's a white man's religion, even though, again, that's false. Okay. So you hit on a couple of different things there. One, you highlighted the difference between, you said, a biblical ethic as, mm -hmm. as it relates to what a Christian is versus somebody just, that just grew up in church right. or had a, a family different. member that was a minister. <laughs> yeah. So clarify what exactly is that difference because just generally speaking most people i feel like if I, most black people i talk to if i ask them they're never going to say i'm an atheist they're not right. typically going to say i don't believe in god uh it's either i'm spiritual not religious i'm a christian i believe in god but i don't go to church yeah so I, I go to church i think so i always hit people like that we're asking the wrong question if you ask someone yeah are you saved? Then, then we say, do you go to church? We're, we're making a, a non-biblical correlation. My question is, do you understand the gospel? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it. It being the gospel is the power of salvation in Romans 1.16. And so uh, a lot of people in black community, but not just our community, um, uh, uh, associate church attendance with salvation yeah. and discipleship. The Bible doesn't. And that's the problem is there's a gospel problem, misunderstanding the gospel. And there's a discipleship problem because Christians, some some Christians, I'm putting that in quotes. The Bible says the disciples were called Christians in 11 uh, Acts 11, 26. And so people think discipleship is another level of maturity. But no, that's the expectation. That's what Jesus told us to do. So for me, I'm asking, do you understand that the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died and defeated death for your sins that salvation is eternal and it cannot be lost and it cannot be earned ephesians 2 8 and 9 for it is by grace and through faith that you are saved not by works, so that no man can boast and that's that's part of the problem the biblical illiteracy the lack of gospel centrality and again I, i'm not speaking like this is not just a problem in black community i, I want to be clear because mm -hmm. some some people on the outskirts want to make uh as if blacks have a monopoly on depravity. Uh, no, we're not going to play that game. It ain't just on us. But in general, generally speaking, that's the problem is we're, we're asking people about church attendance instead of the gospel. We need to ask a gospel question to see someone's understanding of the faith. And so that's been it's like I've asked people, do you understand the gospel? They said, yeah, I'm Baptist. I'm like, no, I did. That, that's not a denominational question. Mm -hmm. That's part of the issue, man, is we, we got to help people understand the gospel and we got to disciple people and teach our people biblical literacy and apologetics so they know what they believe and still a quote from my sister lisa fields to know what they believe and why mm -hmm. so i think there's a lot of belief issues that come into play obviously yeah. when it comes to faith yeah. and church attendance but also what i hear a lot is uh people not wanting to at least be involved with church and they maybe they may turn away from the faith completely uh -huh. but they don't want to be involved because they see a lot of chaos hypocrisy mm -hmm. and mess in church mm -hmm. and not just members but even from pastors and leaders okay so a lot of people are like hey i don't like if people that hold the title that you hold yeah uh have done some some bad stuff absolutely so i know that in many cases like previous generations uh the culture is kind of a don't ask, don't tell thing. Well, people just mind their business. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the perception is it seems like pastors are presented as a man of the cloth. Yeah. These these uh, greater than life people. But people are starting to realize that that was somewhat of a facade, that they're not necessarily all just these great uh, walking around on a cloud type people. They actually do some of the same stuff that the sinners do mm -hmm. so how would you respond to the critique that uh those in leadership and churches pastors aren't uh following through with the morality that they preach yeah i would say it's a fair critique i mean i, I think that's something that can't be denied but we don't have to just look in the church again if we're saying we're christians we can just look in the bible david cheats murders the woman's uh husband co tries to cover it up god sends nathan the prophet to rebuke him um, Moses's ministry, uh, it's not directly, but essentially starts with 
a murder. Uh, he sees two, he sees an Egyptian beating the Hebrew and he kills the Egyptian and buries him. Years later, he ends up starting. He finally responds to the call of God. Uh, we see Amnon uh, and Tamar. He rapes his, he rapes his uh, half sister and David does nothing about it. Right. And Absalom ends up killing his brother. <clears throat> it's a lot of ugly stuff in there. People got to read the Bible. I mean, for that, themselves. That's just, yeah, yeah, for themselves, but but in context too, because yeah. you don't you don't say why well, I feel it mean no. I mean that God has an intent for it, but yes, I would say so. Yes, it is a fair critique, and the Bible is and I, I, some slang. It's the realest book you're gonna read. It does not hide the ugliness of humanity. <clears throat> Here's part of the problem. I did a series uh, not too long ago, long ago called Church Hurt. And I did a message out of Ezekiel 34 on spiritual abuse from pastors and leaders. And it lays it out. It lays out what a, an abusive leader looks like. In the, again, in the text, that these priests were about themselves. They were about money. They were taking advantage of women. They were trying to build their own platform. It's all there. And here's part of the problem. So these leaders need to be called out. The Bible says in James 3.1, that if pastors are under a stricter judgment in Hebrews 13, 17, it says that they must answer to God for the souls of the people that they pastor. So again, the Bible is putting this weight like they're not. So I want to first say they're not getting away with anything, even though I'm and what I mean by that, I'm not saying that there aren't victims because there are. There have been some victims of uh, molestation, of adultery, of uh, embezzlement. So they're actual victims. What I am saying is they're not getting away with that when we think about eternal judgment. They're under stricter judgment, and they're going to have to answer that. I pray some of them will answer now and repent. So that's the first thing. But here's the other side of it. I also did a message about how pastors get hurt. And one of the things is some of these same pastors that are abusive, why do they still have an audience? Because we are putting gifted communication above character. Hmm. And and the, the church got to own that. You knew he cheated on his wife, but he preaches you happy and you keep going. You you know that he has several women pregnant, but you keep watching them on TBN. You you keep sowing a seed. You we have to we have to say, okay, we, we're not going to support the ministries of these abusive pastors. And we gotta hold them to repent and live according to the biblical standard. Why is it that, why are you dropping money at the feet? If you go to Acts chapter four, when they drop money at the feet, the, the money went to people who are in need. Ask your pastor, is he doing that? Because we're not supposed to get a tip for a good point in the sermon. That's not a biblical framework. So my, my thing is, yeah, we need to own this. Pastors need to repent. We need to operate in humility. We need to apologize when we're wrong. I've been pastoring been in ministry over 20 years, been pastoring 10 years. And I understand, yeah, I mean, I've, I've messed up. I've needed to apologize to people. And when, it, when I did this series, one of the first things I said is, I said, I've been a victim of church hurt and I've caused church hurt. Mm -hmm. I've caused it. I have hurt some people. And uh, that's part of my frailty as a person. But I need to apologize. And we need to hold people to that. But we got to stop funding abusers. And that's what a lot of church people, and we, we're, since, we're, since we're being specific, within our black community, you're funding the abusers. You're paying for that jet. You're paying for that Bentley. And uh, uh, a guy did a, a play called Believers You Pay for the Show years ago, and he was highlighting that. And so that's what's happening now. So, again, I own the critique, but I also want to say, hey, guys, let's, why are you still supporting them? Mm -hmm. let, let, let's, so we can't say two things. Hey, man, we need to but then you keep supporting these guys and they're not going to be faithful and they're not even faithful to the text. They're not faithful to their wives, but because they can sit, they can put a point together. See, just because they're not faithful don't mean they can't talk. We have to stop putting gifted communication above character. So how do we, well, how do folks in those situations determine the line? Because I hear, all right, pastors aren't perfect. So don't put them on a pedestal. They're men. So they will True. make mistakes. But then on the other end, it's like, how far is too far? Is it two affairs, three affairs? Like, how do we draw a line with, uh, because obviously I know sometimes a critique for Christianity is uh, the idea of forgiveness mm -hmm. allows unlimited abuse. Yeah. So how does one draw the line then? Or how, how is the church supposed to handle that? When is fought too far? How, how do you know when you went too far? And yeah. when should someone 
it not just be a I apologize thing, you but keep a doing step down thing. Yeah. 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 So so again, I'm gonna keep I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, Malik, but we gotta go back to that daggone Bible. Okay. The the Bible <laughs> <laughs> it, it it addresses the stuff we're talking about yeah. because this isn't new. First Timothy five teaches us how to deal with leaders who are in sin. And so if you have a pastor who's had an affair, he should not be preaching that following Sunday as if nothing happened. Now, it's not a one size fits all in terms of the whole sit down time frame, but the, the idea of church discipline is a biblical framework. And again, I already said James 3, 1, if that man's up, if that person's a pastor, they're under stricter judgment. So, so, so think of it this way. We, we, there's a lot talking about police brutality, right? Mm -hmm. Because when they take that job, what we're going to say is you have a very difficult job. No one's advocating to get rid of all police. We're talking about the abuse of power. And so when someone says blue lives matter, my response is they do, but my blackness wasn't a choice. Your uniform was. I was born this. You chose that. Mm -hmm. And it's because you chose this profession, it comes with a standard. When I, when I answer the call of God, that comes with a standard. To be a pastor. To be a pastor. Mm -hmm. So I have a standard to where I, I, I don't have the same judgment, in a sense, that the members do because I'm under strict judgment. I don't, they don't have to answer for my soul to God, but I got to answer to God for theirs. Hebrews 13, 17. So we, we got to let the Bible lead that. So 1 Timothy 5 addresses like, yeah, that, that person should, there should be a reconciliation process. Let me be clear about that. Not permanent dismissal as if they're beyond grace, but what does repentance look like? You should turn from it. Now you talked about unlimited forgiveness. The Bible says to forgive as you've been forgiven. How, how have we been forgiven? Well, we got to first acknowledge our sin. That, that reconciliation is impossible without confrontation. Jesus confronted and dealt with our sin on the cross. And it's by faith we acknowledge that we're in sin, the wrong, and we receive the forgiveness. Has the pastor actually acknowledged it? It's not just saying, I'm sorry. It's what, what, what does accountability look like? A lot of things that hurt me is to see how they treat the pastor's wife. The guy cheats, but he has an amazing speaking gift. And then she gets thrown to the side and that he continues and he might, he might lose 20% of the church. He should lose more than that. If he's unrepentant again, I'm saying if he's unrepentant, we got it. We got to allow room for grace, but grace is never a license to sin. And so uh, if they're acknowledging that sin, then they're turning from that. They're trying to save their marriage they're not marrying the, the 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 whoever the mistress was. They're trying to save if the woman that he was married to was trying to keep the marriage. That needs to be the focus because the, the qualification, again, I'm in this Bible, y'all, 1 Timothy 3, is that you got to lead your family well first. Hmm. You got to lead the family. So the family precedes the title. I always tell people this when I'm training young pastors and I train men, I say, this is my order. Son, my first title, son. I am a son of Yeshua, Jesus. I am a son of Yeshua. This is a title I didn't earn and the most important title I have. I am then a husband to my wife, Crystal. I am a father to Jamari and Jordan. Then I'm a pastor division. That's my order. So, but if you start with pastor, bishop, apostle, all these titles, master, prophet, this, they're making up stuff. When you, when you, when you, if you start there, then you make the focus, the ministry becomes idolatry and you do everything to save that and you let your family fall by the wayside. If, it's, if I start with my sonship, then I'm going to, I'll flow in the proper order. Got it. So if you don't mind, I'm going to turn the dial up a little bit. All right. Uh, there are a lot of terms that get thrown around in today's culture. Uh, one of them is misogyny. Mm -hmm. Uh some critiques for the Bible is that God or the Bible itself is oppressive specifically to women, hmm. uh, which would lend one to believe if that is the case, then Christianity may not be a faith for women. It may be a patriarchal faith that really prioritizes men over women. How would you respond to that? Well, first, I think 
we we again, if we're talking terms, we need to be faithful to what the term means. Okay. Misogyny means hatred of women. And so um, I think they mean massage noir, um, but where, when, if they're saying oppression. But misogyny is this idea of hatred, and I completely disagree with that. When we look at the scriptures, if we read it, we see Deborah, whom God uses as a judge. We see Esther, whom God uses to save the Jewish people. We see Hannah and her faith. We see Rahab, who used to be a prostitute, but God uses her, and she's a part of the lineage of Jesus. We see uh, we see Mary being at the at the tomb. We see women being the first to testify. We see the woman at the well going back and testifying about people. We see Priscilla and Aquila doing ministry together. I can keep going. We see Eunice, um, who, 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 who was used in Timothy's life, whom Paul disciples. So the Bible is frequently championing women, and we see Jesus going against. Now, I'll admit that it was patriarchal. When you look at John chapter 8, they want to stone this woman, but they don't. there's no nothing recorded about the man she committed adultery with. So what does Jesus do? Jesus starts writing. We don't know what he writes. And then all her accusers walk away and he says, look, go and sin no more. He doesn't condemn her. We see Jesus intentionally engaging a Samaritan woman. Right. So we see Phoebe. We see Phoebe uh, in Romans chapter 16, who many would declare to be a deaconess. Uh, we see Chloe who who writes to Paul. And then Paul writes first Corinthians based on a report that he hears from Chloe's people. So. Uh, again, we, we got to get in that thing and read it. And if you see that, you count, you see countless of exa examples of God using people in the first century. They didn't even acknowledge the testimony of a woman. But God uses women to be the first one to testify about his resurrection. Mm -hmm. So th this is him going against that patriarchal, carcical, um, chauvinistic society saying that, hey, the, I, I operate by the Imago Dei. You're made in the image of God. And there's equal value. Now, I'll just go there um, because, you know, I know you, you probably go there anyway. The whole woman pastor thing. Right. So I, I do believe when, when we talk about that roles don't indicate value. So there are some who are complementarian and they would say that the role of pastor is held for a woman. There's those who are egalitarian who say, hey, women can be pastors. Now, for the complementarian view to believe that God has roles. And you can, it's not just First Timothy, you also go to First Corinthians 11, and then Paul talks about headship, and he talks about head covering, and he goes back to Genesis to say how the, the order of things should be. Believing that men are the head has nothing to do with devaluing women. It's dealing with a role of, of, of the way that God set things up. So if you think having a title somehow has to do with your salvation or your identity or your value, that's your issue. The Bible doesn't say that because you don't have this role or this title that you're somehow less than. And so I just think it's important that we we do that. The other side of that is that when you talk about the role, it doesn't mean that women don't have teaching gifts or the ability to speak or it's removing a female, a woman's gifting. These are the conversations that we need to have a little bit more dialogue around as opposed to assuming and reading into the text what Paul meant, what Paul said, and the implications of it. So role has nothing to do with value. Women are not less valued if someone holds a complementarian view that would say that women should not hold the office of elder or pastor. Hi, my name is Malik Blade, and I'm the CEO of the Whole Brother Mission. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. We're a nonprofit offering men assisted access to counseling and therapy nationwide, and we cover fees where needed. Women can receive referrals too. We have a goal of $31,000 by May 31st. Previous donors include Charlemagne the God of the Breakfast Club and Judge Lynn Toller of Marriage Boot Camp and Divorce Court. You can learn more at the GoFundMe button on our website homepage at wholebrothermission.com. Okay. Yeah, I was definitely going there next. But in addition to that, uh, two more things. When you were referencing some different women in the Bible, I think those were more uh, positive stories. Yeah. But what about uh, two that I, I hear a lot about is one, obviously there's there's rape that the Bible records. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mentioned Amnon and Tamar. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, more specifically. And also the idea of, I believe it was uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. where the guys are at the door. And they're saying he offers want to sleep with daughter. you, and he yeah. offers his daughter. Yeah. So I know that's again uh, 
some look at things like that and it seems like a prioritization of because uh, you know in, in today's standards well in any standard really why would a father sacrifice his daughter in that way mm -hmm. uh, and the perception is this is once again evidence of a lack of concern or value attributed to women yeah and I, I would say it's it records his view and his mistakes but is that God's I mentioned Amnon and Tamar, and when that happened, David didn't do anything. I preached this in my church, and I said, family, David failed. This doesn't make the Bible wrong. It records the failures of humanity. People have, we, we got to turn our brains on and say, okay, this is heinous. This is terrible. But where do you see God affirming rape? There's no affirmation of rape. Um, and so that's that's the thing we have to understand that that's not God isn't affirming it. The Bible records the ugliness of sin and how depraved humanity is and how the answer is Christ and his gospel, because we need a spirit. Otherwise, we just want to pursue our desires. And some of those desires are very dark. So what I would say to that is, hey, man, he blew it. I would never if you, you come. To, I would never offer my daughter in that situation. He was afraid and he said something that was wrong. That doesn't mean the Bible affirms what he says. I can show you the imprecatory Psalms where David prays for God to strike the jaw of his enemies. The Psalms are him. This is in the Bible. This is showing someone being real with God, but God doesn't honor his request. So we got to be able to recognize that people are being real that God is a God since he knows everything we can be real and we can vent to him. But then there are things recorded that are heinous and that are terrible. But that doesn't mean that God affirms. We must not confuse what God allows with what God affirms. OK. Uh, I have a couple of things I want to get to, but I almost trailed off on that problem of evil thing. You know, because okay, the question the Odyssey, is, well, why yeah. does God allow these things? Yeah. But I, I want to want to move past that to uh, more the the thing, the buzzwords of today. So we've dealt with uh, patriarchal standards, mm -hmm. misogynoir or misogyny perceived. Uh, next um, is this idea of sexuality. Okay. Obviously, that's a, a hot topic in today's society. Uh -oh. But again, <laughs> one would, a critique is that while I do know that there are churches that are considered affirming churches, that mm -hmm. welcome people of all sexualities. Uh, the critique would all, in many cases, be that the Bible is homophobic. Mm -hmm. um, how would you then respond to the idea? And I'll be more specific. Uh, I was recently in a, a conversation and uh, for, for Howard University, and uh, the idea of sexuality came up, and one of the panelists was uh, gay. And he wanted to make it clear that uh, his sexuality is not a choice. Uh, and I understand that that um, that point of view is very strong today. And those that oppose it are seen very negatively. Mm -hmm. um, so when people look at uh, Christianity or the Bible, uh, what my understanding is, the critique would be that people are being deemed wrong for something that they did not choose to to have. So how would you respond to the critique that God or the Bible is, is homophobic for indicting people for uh, their inclinations? Yeah, so I think first again, we, 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 we need to be clear on terms. A phobia is a fear. The Bible isn't the Bible isn't fearful. It it hits these issues head on. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to dis that aren't going to. Uh, it doesn't mean that people won't disagree with what the Bible says. But the Bible, the Bible's not fearful. The Bible is very clear in First Corinthians five, First Corinthians six. Um, I, I would say this. Um, so you know, we we got the First Corinthians five. Paul is you know still talking and dealing with the church, and you have a guy uh, sleeping with his stepmom. And what what Paul does, Paul. Uh, spends more time talking about the church's response than he does the guy sleeping with his stepmom. And one of the things he says is he says, instead of grieving, you guys are being arrogant. You're boastful. 
And essentially, to use kind of more modern terms, this church thought that they were progressive. Um, so sometimes what is socially progressive is spiritually regressive. But that doesn't only apply to homosexuality. So I do think the church, we have to do a better job. When we look at the verses and we go to chapter six of First Corinthians, we zoom in on and he says well, they want to inherit the, the, the kingdom of God. Um, but he, he also talks about people who are verbally abusive in the same line where he talks about homosexuals. So we, we, we got to first be consistent with the whole abomination talk that it's not like this is a special sin or whatever. And I know they try to point to God tearing down Sodom and Gomorrah, but uh, mm -hmm. but 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 God flooded the entire earth, and then He starts over with, in a sense, with Noah. So there's always redemption. So I think that's first we got to do a better job of saying, let's stop zooming in on the homosexual, but accepting the heterosexual fornicator. We got to make sure we're not preaching a heterosexual gospel. Your sexuality doesn't save you. And before I transition, your sexuality is a feature of who you are. This is the this is the biblical sexual ethic. Your sexuality is a feature of who you are, but it's not the foundation of who you are. For Christians, Christ is our foundation, not our urges. Second part I would say is this, is when, when someone says this is um, not a choice, I do push back and there's, a, there's an element of that where I disagree. Your urge may not be a choice. Your desire may not be a choice, but how you act on that is a choice. And so for a heterosexual man who... Because because one of the essential elements of Christian discipleship, Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if you want to be my disciple, you must first do what? Deny yourself. I'm glad it's very, it doesn't say everything. It just says deny yourself. Why? Because some of that may be sexual desires you got to deny. Might be financial desires you got to deny. It might be things you want to say that you got to deny. It's, an, it's an intentionally ambiguous to say, listen, there may, God may cause you to deny at any given point anything. And I get it. So some people, I know some people may comment and say, well, see, that, that's not fair or, or, or whatever. No, the, the denial of scripture is not just for heterosexuals. So heterosexuals have to deny uh, urges to be faithful. I think we, we have to, the, my homosexual brothers who want to push back uh, need to be consistent. The Bible is not only asking you to deny yourself. It's asking any disciple to deny themselves. That includes heterosexuals. There are aspects of themselves that they must deny as well, even sexually, if they're going to be consistent and say, I'm going to be committed to this one woman. That doesn't mean they don't recognize other attractive women, but they have to deny that to be faithful. We have to deny things we want sometimes to be faithful to God. So we got to be consistent. And so for those that would say that that would be my biblical response, because what I find is in order to justify, they always have to go outside of scripture. Mm -hmm. They can't they can't stay in scripture. To justify their conclusion, they have to go outside it. If we stay within it, you have to come to the conclusion that you just want to do what you want to do sexually that it, that may sound harsh but that applies to the homosexual as well like there's a rise of polyamory people are doing what they want to do so i would say and that's again I, i've been quoting a lot of scripture because that's my viewpoint not my opinion his word shapes how i engage all of these subjects and that's what that's what I would say. So it's not homophobic, but I do think our posture. Here's what I will say. And I shared this with my church recently. I said we can handle sin sinfully. So I'm going to be let me just be straight up. I believe that homosexuality is a sin, but I also believe heterosexual fornication is a sin. And I believe the church has handled the sin of homosexuality sinfully because we've been unloving in our engagement. We've been hypocritical by focusing on them and letting the heterosexual fornicator sleep with all the women because he can play the piano. Good, play the keys. We've been, so we've, we've, we've addressed that sin sinfully and we need to repent, we need to apologize, we need to be more loving, but that doesn't change the biblical standard. So to be clear, you're saying you believe the heterosexual fornicator and the homosexual are both sin in sin. Absolutely. But you're saying you believe that that sin, not just a personal opinion that happened to come out, but you have formed your opinion based off of what you believe the Bible is saying. Yeah, off of what scripture is so saying. the Bible how says it, that those things are sins? Yeah, it says that, that homosexuality in 1 Corinthians 6, but also fornication, still in 1 Corinthians 6 and Romans chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 5. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So 
and, and moving forward, I want to get to the book. Uh, and what I think of is recently a uh, gospel artist, Kier Sheard, was on The Breakfast Club. And uh, Charlemagne yeah. uh, asked her about the Bible. And he asked her, do you think people are kind of moving away from Christianity because they recognize the Bible was written by our oppressor? Uh, she kind of fumbled the question. She didn't. I think she, later she admitted that certain things she, she wasn't equipped to, to answer. Uh, so I'll allow you to do so. How would you okay. respond to that question that are, are black people moving away from the Christian yeah. faith because the Bible was written by our oppressor? Yeah, so the answer in, in part is yes, they're moving away because they think it was written by our oppressor, but the, the notion that it was written by our oppressor is actually inaccurate. So Charlemagne, there's a lot that he does not understand or know or have researched about history. Charlemagne, you ever want to talk, brother, I would love to come on the show and answer your questions. And I promise you, I won't answer your fact-based questions with faith-based answers. I will give you historical and archeological receipts. So, um, so I, I think, yes, the answer is yes, but again, they're doing that based on misinformation. John Mark, the Gospel of Mark, he was a Cyrenian Jew. That means he was an African man. There's a theology, there's a concept that you learn in seminary known as Mark and Priority. What Mark and Priority states is that the Gospel of Mark was written first. So an African man wrote the Gospel of Mark, and most likely the other synoptic gospels of uh, Matthew and Luke are based off of his. Charlemagne, how come you didn't bring that up? Most likely because you didn't know that. If you would have known, he probably wouldn't have asked that question. The Hebrews were not a whole bunch of white folk. Moses did not lead a million white folk out <laughs> of Egypt. Okay. The Bible is filled with people of color. We have the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, four of the women in Jesus's earthly, earthly lineage are of Hamitic descent. So there's there's tons of black and brown presence in the Bible. I actually address that in my book, The Whitewashing of Christianity. I address these things. Most of the the, the most popular uh, 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 African scholars that give us things like the Trinity and patristics and philosophy and theology were African in the second and third and fourth century, over a thousand years before the transatlantic slave trade. The three continents primarily where we have Bible transmission are Africa, Europe, and Asia. And Europe is, is the one that would be kind of somewhat late to the party. So uh, in order for him to come to that conclusion, the, he, he, would, he, the, he would be asserting that all of these manuscripts we have, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that had tons of manuscripts that, go, that are close to the time of Jesus. That for these to be tainted, as he asserts, that these manuscripts for African, Asia, and Europe would all have to be tainted. They would have to be tainted before they are found um, and by this Bedouin monk uh, in this cave. And they would have to preserve this lie for thousands of years. No Uber, no cars, all over these continents for centuries and still hold the same truths. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that, then I got an island for you at a playground. So we have to dig in and know our history. Many of the things that are in there have been found in the places where they are recorded in Scripture. And so I just think that's that's important that we, we have to know about these African church fathers, the black and brown presence in the Bible, the Hamitic descent within Jesus's lineage. Moses having um, a, a dark sister as his wife lets us know that the lineage of a lot of Jewish people would, 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 would be at the bare minimum mixed race and not white and European. The issue, of course, is the title of my book, Whitewashing. We, we have to admit that Christianity has been whitewashed as it relates to imagery. But again, that doesn't remove the black and brown presence that exists and still exists despite the efforts of uh, those who want to whitewash the Bible. To, to update this idea of whitewashing, you addressed it from a historical perspective mm -hmm. and iconography and things like that. But I think of... Uh, in the present day, um, I think a group of black people maybe got exposed to a type of Christianity that they may not have known about before, specifically as it relates to our recent elections. So in 2016, we yeah. had the 
the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump election. And I'm sure, you know, it's, it's not taboo to say that many people saw uh, President Trump as an immoral person. However, he got a very large amount of support mm -hmm. from the Christian community, mm -hmm. specifically a commu Christian community called white evangelicals. Um, now, I think that's important because that helps you understand that Christianity, even itself, as far as that label, is very diverse. Um, so it's not that all Christians in a very large manner were endorsing and supporting President Trump, but it was a specific brand of Christianity. And uh, what you'll find is uh, what's articulated is that um, in order to be faithful to God, to do the right thing as far as how you relate in the world that you're in, you have to then engage politically. And then when you engage politically, you should support people based off of values like uh, being anti-abortion. So many in that camp would say that because you're a Christian, you should then support this candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously there are several other things that people could point to to say, well, that candidate seems to be out of step with what I understand Christianity to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, I understand you're saying it was whitewashed historically, but uh, how should we respond uh, as, as African-Americans who were just figuring out faith generally? How do you how would you think we should respond to that particular brand of Christianity being one of the most prominent and visible ones and not yeah. just uh, from a conservative perspective uh but also you see the likes of people like paula white who can be considered more pentecostal who was still very much so uh thinking through things in this way it couples a party with christianity is that the case for you as far as uh those things being intertwined because that is a message that was very <laughs> But so nah. communicated to the nation. So, so absolutely not. <laughs> so so in my book, uh, it's called The White Washington Christianity. Then the subtitle was A Hidden Past. That's what I want to unpack. Africa's contribution to the Christian faith because it's hidden. That's why Charlemagne asked that question. This And it's not even covered in, in our reformed seminaries. A lot of times the Africanness of these church fathers is hidden. It's not mentioned. The imagery doesn't match. They, they have these white, pretty much present all of them as white men um, and and even uh, Perpetual Felicity, African female martyrs presented as white women. So that's the hidden past. But then I, I deal with a hurtful present. And part, in, in part, I deal with responses to whitewashing. And I deal with three, liberation, self-hatred, and then urban apologetics. Uh, when, I, when I go into the urban apologetics, I talk about how one of the things of the elements of this gospel-centered uh, movement of urban apologetics is to call out Christian nationalism. And the reality is neither party, Democrat or Republican, neither party has a kingdom agenda. Now, you asked me specifically about the Republican Party. When you go to their website and you look and you look at their uh, their statement or bylaws, it says the first thing, the first thing is we believe in American exceptionalism. That's the core value. First thing ain't God. First thing isn't scripture. First thing they believe in is American exceptionalism. OK, well, if you're exceptional, you got to be talking about the people. We ain't talking about the land. You're saying that Americans mm -hmm. are exceptional. You leave in, believe in American exceptionalism. Okay. Well, as we begin to dig into that, that point alone opposes the biblical view. The biblical view is, hey, man, you're born in sin and you need salvation. We, we don't see ourselves as exceptional. We see ourselves as in need of salvation. Our God is exceptional. So when you begin to dig into the elements of conservatism, you see that while uh, they may champion certain things that I would agree with, I, I believe for me, if black lives matter, it makes sense that they got to matter in the womb. How can they matter everywhere but the womb? And so I like to quote my boy, Show Baraka. He says, fight for justice from creation to the tomb. I know black lives matter and they should matter in the womb. So there most I would even argue most African Americans are pro life. We just don't come around saying that all the time. We we're, we're engaging people. We're actually doing the work. 
But the other side of this is the issue with the conservative side is they talk about pro-life, but it doesn't extend beyond the womb. So they're really pro-birth because if you're biblically pro-life, then you would be pro-life and anti-police brutality. You would care about my life outside the womb. And so for me, I'm going to always push back and say, hey, if you are authentically pro-life, then you care about unarmed black and brown people being shot at the police. And if you're truly biblical, you won't deny the evidence of police brutality because you believe in total depravity, which means that brutality, uh, that sin can come in the form of a white man in a blue uniform with a black gun pointed at an unarmed brown man. So let's be consistent. And I'm in the book, Acts 16. Paul was a victim of police brutality. So there's a lot of inconsistencies from this Christian nationalist, which is idolatrous and it is unbiblical, but they have a lot to say about the woke. And I, and I, and I don't affirm unredeemed wokeness either, but it's interesting. They got a lot to say about the woke crowd, but they won't deal with themselves. The ethic of the Bible, like I'm going back to that first Corinthians five. And let me, let me say this, cause we talked about homosexuality. Um, that, that is not a sin that is outside of the realm of God's forgiveness either. I want to make sure I, I, I say that because I didn't get to address that. When Paul is dealing with it in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, he still comes back to grace, but he spends more time dealing with the church, dealing in-house. Republicans need to rebuke themselves. They need to deal with the inconsistencies with these people claiming to be Christians, but who are unloving. They shall know you are Christians by your love for who? One another. And so rather than making fun of your brothers and sisters who are in the same faith, who want to fight for justice... You should do as Isaiah say, let's come and reason together for a point of understanding. Mm -hmm. So a Christian should not feel comfortable in either party. If anything, I, th this is what this is what a Christian would look like, a woke conservative, an oxymoron. Because <laughs> it don't match, do it. Because you should never feel at home in either party. Why? Neither party has a kingdom agenda. The one given the kingdom agenda is the church. That's us. And we need to be, we need to know what's going on. The most important form to, to, the, to talk to, so I can deal with the liberals right quick. The most important form of wokeness is being awakened to your sin, Ephesians, and your need of salvation. That's where wokeness must start. If we start there, then we can begin to see people a little more clearly and we'll be less self-righteous and less uh, unbiblically judgmental. So it seems like you have a faith based off our conversations and, and your book. It seems like you have a faith that you feel is being misrepresented. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's, it's been because to associate uh, Christianity, Christianity, conservatism is not Christianity. And what I see, especially with the Christian nationalist crowd, is they're more conservative than Christian. Because you can look at how they handle disagreements, how they make certain they make their opinions Bible, which is you're not supposed to add to the scriptures. So there's tons of hypocrisy. And it was funny is they're guilty of the things they claim that the woke crowd is guilty of. They're, they're more woke than they like to believe. And so they're, they're guilty of a lot of those things. And so for me, I'm going to say I'm going to say, listen, yeah, I, I am a Christian first. I am a black man. I understand injustice. I've been a victim of uh racial profiling in school and driving my Mitsubishi. I've, I've experienced that. And so, uh, but that, but that does not mean I'm going to live with hate and bitterness. I'm going to keep living, but I am going to say something the same way Paul did when he was a victim of police brutality and they tried to release him silently. Paul said, heaven to the null, you beat me publicly. You owe me an apology for the injustice that you enacted on me and and what's funny is malik the reason they the reason they didn't try to do, sweep it under the rug is they found out that he had dual citizenship that's the posture of the believer we got dual citizenship the bible tells us in philippians 120 philippians 320 our citizenship is in heaven so my true citizenship is there but i live here so I bring that kingdom ethic, that kingdom worldview, that kingdom mindset, that kingdom sexual ethic, that kingdom view of politics, that kingdom view of humanity, that kingdom view of race. I bring that here. But my primary citizenship is there. So that's why I speak and I and I can offend anybody at any given time because I'm going to stand on what the word says. So take us home with this. We've we've touched on different themes uh, surrounding the book. Mm -hmm. But what are you hoping to communicate 
through your book, The Whitewashing of Christianity. Yeah, so The Whitewashing of Christianity, uh, it'll be, uh, should be available for pre-order soon. And uh, I'm, we're looking at a June release date, um, June 2021. Um, uh, the, the biggest thing is I want to give legitimacy to the concerns of those who recognize where they're wrongly saying, hey, Christianity is a white man's religion. I'm pushing back against that, but I'm saying, hey, I want to give legitimacy to your concerns. We've been inundated with white images of Jesus, white images of Moses, 12 white disciples, a white Mary. All of these Middle Eastern Jews have been presented as white men and women. So I want to say, hey, due to iconography, and so I want to tell you how that happened. So we're giving you somewhat of a history lesson, but then I want to take you again to the, uh, when I deal with that hidden past and the hurtful present, I want to talk about the impacts of it. So I talk about, there's a chapter called Self-Hatred, The Making of a Coon, but coon is an acrostic. I'm not sitting here saying, hey, this guy's a coon. No, I'm, I'm dealing with how when you internalize racism and inferiority, it turns into self-hatred to when you don't see yourself no longer as an image bearer. So, so, so that's what I, I'm doing there. But then I end with a hope for future to say, um, wow, we did not find Christ on a plantation, black, black people. We knew him before then. Christianity is an indigenous African faith. I'm going to say it again. Christianity is an indigenous African faith shaped by people in Africa. And, we, and, 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 and that, that, that should remind us of how God has used black and brown people in his plan of redemption. We need to know that. So I want to restore that. But our hope is not in our blackness, is not in white allies, it's in Yeshua. It's in what he did for us. But in him doing that, we're empowered to call out what happened. So I'm calling out what happened. I'm addressing what happened. I'm giving legitimacy to their concerns. But I'm saying I got to refuse your conclusion that Yeshua isn't for you. Because, number one, you're basing it off of inaccurate uh, information. You're a part of his plan. People who look like you have been used. Matter of fact, they wrote, wrote stuff first. A lot of the things we have in seminary were shaped by African people. And so that's what I'm hoping. And then lastly, I'm praying for some dissent groups. And what I mean by dissent groups is people who disagree on this. I have I have discussion questions at the end of each chapter. And I'm hoping that people who disagree can be adults and grow up and mature and say, can we disagree without being disrespectful? Let's talk about it. And again, let's talk about it. Let's look at the evidence presented. I have tons of citations. This is not an emotional response. This is a well thought out historical response rooted in scripture and the gospel for me to come to these conclusions. So that's what I'm hoping. And I'm engaging non-believers. So it's not written specifically for Christians. I'm quoting Killer Mike. I'm quoting Lena Waithe. I'm quoting Umar Johnson. I'm quoting a lot of people. Uh, I'm quoting Charlemagne. I'm quoting Chris Rock. Things that in particular, more primarily black people have said about Christianity that were inaccurate. But I understand how they got there. So uh, that, that's my hope is that, you know, I got several hopes, but uh, I'm praying you'll read it and it'll it'll spark some good, healthy discussion. Well, all right. Uh, let them know where to get it. Yeah. So it'll be available on Amazon, Amazon, Bars and Nobles, Book, Books a Million and my website, Jerome Gay Jr. dot dot com. J.E.R.O.M.E.G.A.Y.J.R. dot com. You can follow me on IG and Twitter at Jerome Gay and on Facebook, Pastor Jerome Gay Jr. Well, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for listening and thank you for engaging. I right, thank you for having me.